Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the Praying Christian Women podcast. I'm Jamie Hampton, and today I'm really excited to be here with Amy Lively, author of Can I Borrow a Cup of Hope? Lessons from First Peter. Um, I am just really excited to have you here, Amy, because I feel like um, this topic is so important, um, maybe today more than ever, but just this message of finding hope no matter what, no matter what the circumstances, no matter what life throws at you. And I just, I love what you've done in this devotional, in this book um, to do that, to point us there. So thank you for being here to talk about it. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, it's such a message that it was so relevant when Peter wrote it 2000 years ago. It is even more relevant for us today. Um, I actually started, I started teaching this material from first Peter in my home to a group of neighbors who came for a Bible study, gosh, like a dozen years ago. But then I taught it again during the pandemic where, gosh, if we ever needed a sip of hope, it was that crazy time. And I remember like New Year's Eve of 2020 going into 21. I was like, I can't wait to put this year behind us and move on to something new and fresh. It's so exciting. And what was it? Six days later, we're like, oh, the world's erupting again, just in a whole different way. And gosh, I think that there's one thing that we, that we know is that if we don't have a problem today, we did yesterday and we will tomorrow. Like it's just guaranteed. Um, it's one of the promises that Peter made and Jesus made in this world, you will have troubles or you will have suffering in this world. And we're all going to need this message of hope at some point in our lives, whether it's a global, um, something like the pandemic, or if it's very so local that it's just right. No one knows, but us how desperate we are for hope. Yeah. And I, actually I misquoted your, I, I was reading something different. The actual title of your book is, can I borrow a cup of hope? How to find faith for hard times in first Peter. And so I kind of, yeah. I sort of truncated the title there, but yeah, <laughs> I love it. Well, before we get into the book, we love to ask all of our guests what your favorite prayer closet is and just whatever uh, it could be off the wall. It could be a yeah. literal closet. Where do you go to meet with God? You know, what's funny is that when I was a little kid and I still have my Bible from when I was like grade school, my Me favorite too. verse, like my, my life verse, it's so strange for a life verse for a child was Matthew six, six. But when you pray, go away into your room and shut the door behind you and your father who sees everything in secret will reward you. Like what child has that as their verse? Let me tell you, it was not because like, I was like the most devout prayer who has had that prayer closet since I was a child. I don't know why I picked that verse, but I always knew it was Matthew six, six. That was, that was for me. It honestly probably had more to do with wanting to keep my faith very private and um, not be ridiculed for that at school. Um, but I've always just known that verse so well of go in, shut the door behind you. But my prayer closet is got to be, there's two places. Um, one is my recliner, which is, is over here somewhere. If you could, if you can see it, just that place where I take my French press thermos in the morning and sit, mm -hmm. uh, I love to be up before dawn and watch the sun come up and just have that time of quiet and solitude. Um, so it's got to be my recliner, but also the shower. For some reason, I pray really well in the shower. I love to stay in there until the water's all gone and uh, and just have that solitude and uh, just being still and quiet. I totally agree with you. So the shower, I have heard people say, so A, some moms will say when they have young kids that it's one of the few places that they don't get barged in on, but they mm -hmm. usually get barged in on anyway. But it's a place where nobody's going to bother you. Um, mm -hmm. No matter who you are or what you're doing, I think just the shower is a place where there are no distractions. There's no That's, I think, input, the key, no distraction. No mm -hmm. input. And I've also heard that scientists have some of their greatest scientific revelations in the shower. And I was just listening to a podcast recently about how there are, there's just, there are just, there's like something about being in a place where your thoughts are free to kind of ruminate. And, mm -hmm. and it, it makes sense that not only would your thoughts ruminate, but your conversation with God apart from distractions would also kind of thrive in that area. So, you know, in that yeah, well, atmosphere. You know, 
Jesus went to the wilderness to pray. Right. Um, yeah. It's the same, a very different sensation, physical sensation, but that same sense of isolation, privacy, and undistractedness that I think is important to us. It is. And yeah, and it, it goes maybe not to the letter of the life verse that you shared, but to the spirit of it, definitely as you mm-hmm. go, you close mm-hmm. your door, you're in this place where nobody else is. And yeah, hopefully no one can see you. I mean, in this day and age, who knows? Maybe Alexa's watching, <laughs> but let's hope not. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, well, let's get into this book and which, I mean, it's a book, it's a devotional, it's kind of everything all wrapped up into one. It I is. Love it. It's, an, it's a new hybrid format that I was so, so anxious to try. So like I said, I, I started teaching this in a, in a group of women in my living room. I've taught it in church Bible study settings mm-hmm. and nobody wants to hear somebody just go on and on and on. I mean, my, my, I like interaction. I like to stop and talk about it and get your ideas and hear what you have to say. Mm-hmm. Um, stand up, get a refill of the coffee, right? And so the book is broken up like that. Each chapter is divided into lessons. You could do a lesson a day. You know, that's it's very manageable. Um, but then, you know, the lessons are just, you know, a few pages. And at the end, there are those topics where we stop and talk about it. What does this mean to you? How do you relate to this? What else does the Bible have to say about this? And how can we apply it in our own lives? So in that sense, it's a Bible study kind of built into the book. And those questions also are great for small group discussions. I love going into God's word in the community of worshiping people. And so it is a book. You can just read it front to back. You can skip over all the questions if you'd like. It's a Bible study. You can take it as deep as you would like. It's a small group curriculum. Um, but it's also a devotional. There's a prayer in every lesson that is to really help us to take what we've learned and turn it back to the Lord and say, really give our permission and start that conversation of how does this work into my life? I love that. And I really enjoy the wording. Can I borrow a cup of hope? I mean, it brings me back to the days when I would literally, my mom would send me next door to borrow a cup of sugar or a stick Mm -hmm. of butter from the neighbor because that's what you did. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if anyone does. I don't do that anymore. I don't do Do you know my first book. My first book was called How to Love Your Neighbor Without Being Weird. And so that I love the connectedness between the two titles because it still implies that we we need something from other people, whether it's love or sugar or hope. And heck yeah, I do that because that's the best way to get to know people is to um, have that interdependentness. You know, we're so big in Western thought of our independence, but that interdependence is, I think, much more of a of a of a Jesus follower principle. And and especially, especially hope. Absolutely. And, and it is so true that I, I think most of us have been there in a place where you need to borrow hope from someone else. You can't dig deep enough to find even the energy sometimes to pray for hope or to look to Mm -hmm. God. And, and so you do need to borrow that hope, whether it's from, you know, someone in scripture, or sometimes it's quite literally from someone that's just willing to sit there with you and, and pray for you or just hold your hand or, or, you know, be there when you don't have it in you at all. And I mean, that's the, the Bible tells us, you know, that even our struggles, and I'm, I'm sure this is in the book as well, or, you know, our, even our struggles are designed so that even the struggles aren't wasted where, you know, God uses those so that we can encourage others in their suffering. And yeah, hmm. the the book follows the the five little chapters of first Peter. It's just a few, few pages in your Bible, but it begins with, you know, Peter is writing to exiles who um, you may be an exile or an alien, an immigrant in a foreign country as those people were, who were literally cast out from everything you've ever known. You can be an exile in your own little recliner, in your prayer closet, um, in a in a home or a culture that's hostile to your faith, um, but also anytime we're feeling lonely or isolated or separated, I think we we have that that feeling of being exiled. And then all of us as Christians, you know, we know this world is not our home. We're striving towards something that's more eternal. So we start there in that place of of loneliness, a place of suffering, a place of questioning God. This is all straight from First Peter if the prophets could question God, then we can too. And, but then as you move through the book and Peter takes us from this, this place of hopelessness, we end up finding our hope in God, your faith and your hope are in God. And then by the end of this little book of first Peter, 
we're realizing that the same thing is happening to other people around the world and we're giving praise and glory back to God. So we end with how to share our story of what God has done um, both to us and then through us as it goes on to other people. That's beautiful. That is so it exactly. I mean, that's, that's discipleship. That's loving people like Christ. And I think that's the way we were designed to operate. Yeah. Um, go ahead. It, um, I'm sorry. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> I know you can cut that out. <laughs> that's okay. Um, well, if you think about it, let me know. Um, yeah. Well, so in your book, I love this story that you share. It's so funny. And it's also just spot on a great analogy. You talk about riding the car with your daughter and, and she gives, she, she asks you, where are you taking me, mom? I I think we say that all the time. Do you have those little things in your family where you, now you say it all the time. Where are you taking me? Where are you taking me from? She was just a little tiny toddler. She like, she knew where she was. She has a great sense of direction. She gets it from her dad. They know things like north that like are meaningless yes. to me. Like I, I I'm with so you, Amy. Challenged. Yeah. I am. But they have, resonated with that. <laughs> yeah. But they have this sense of direction of um, physically where their bodies are in relation to where they're traveling to. But you know, just because I don't know um, how to get someplace doesn't mean I don't have this perfectly plotted out map of my life and how I expect it to go when I want to get there whether it's a a milestone or a a bank balance or a career or number of kids or grandkids or like we have these plans there's nothing wrong with our plans I mean sometimes they're good and holy plans but so many times we we come to this bridge out barricade that just stops us in our tracks and and that's when we turn to the Lord and say where are you where are you taking me and you know, I've always heard God um, compared to a, a GPS that right. guides us or when to go, but no, like I'm the GPS because I'm the one who's going recalculate, recalculate, make a U-turn, like turn around. This is not how I plan. This is not how I want to go. And uh, we find ourselves in unfamiliar places, uncharted territory, running races. We didn't sign up for, we didn't even get the t-shirt. Like this was not in my plans, whether it's abuse or addiction or loss or death or sickness or career sidelines or depression, anxiety, the world gone absolutely crazy. Um, we didn't sign up for this. It's not what, it's not what we planned. Yeah. And I totally resonated with your daughter and I just, I love the little stories throughout about your daughter. She was very precocious and just (laughs) that this little like kindergartner or preschooler at the time is just like, she knew how to get where you were supposed to go and you kind of deviated mm-hmm. from the road and like, where are you taking me? But I think we all feel that way sometimes about, mm-hmm. um, so you talk about our responses and I have experienced this multiple, many times of just this feeling of just like wanting to wriggle out from whatever it is that God has placed on my plate, mm-hmm. you know, just the thing where I'm just mm-hmm. like, no, 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 uh, uh-uh. that's not for me. That's Recalculating. <laughs> I Make a love U-turn. that. Yeah. So yeah. I have definitely used God as the GPS, but what a great, what a great analogy as, you know, looking at us as the GPS trying to direct God. And that often for me is more like it because I am controlling and I've had to fight and God's been teaching me over and over again about surrender and trusting him with my story, trusting him with the directions to take the wheel. You know, God is my co-pilot. You know, I, I would, that, that bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot. And I know people are like, no, God should be the pilot. But I think a lot of times I, you know, he gives us freedom. He gives yeah, us he free does. will. He, he, does. he wants to cooperate with us, yeah. cooperate. He wants us to be involved. It's our, it's our humanity. It's our, the part of us that's made in his image is that we do get to make decisions. We do get to take our own perspective. We do get to get to submit to and surrender to him. And, oh my gosh, when you learn how Peter did that in, at the end of his life with his wife, it's an amazing and beautiful story of, of, of how God uses that suffering to bring himself glory. And it's not to say that like every bad thing that happens to you is somehow good. Some things are awful. They're terrible. The glory is 
when we can recognize that we're in a fallen world and God is still present. He is still there. He is still there filling our cup day after day with hope and faith in him, with his grace and his goodness and the revelation that Christ is right beside us. I owed it to you. So, you know, we talk about the things that we have the choice of, you know, we have the choice to to go one way or another, to turn right or left, but then they're kind of the things that are placed in our lap that we can't choose, that we didn't choose, that mm-hmm. we would never choose for ourselves. And so, you know, when those things happen, you talk in your book about how there are some different responses that we can have when those things, we kind of get cornered, so to speak, mm-hmm. with things that we would not have chosen. Um, what are some of those different responses that we might have when things don't go according to our plans? Oh, gosh. I'll, I'll speak only for myself, right? Because these might not be so flattering, right? We don't want to always put ourselves in this position. But first one, anger. Just really angry of why did this happen? I didn't deserve this. I didn't ask for this. I don't want this. Anger, I think, is a very common and justifiable response. Even a righteous anger especially when there's been an injustice or a wrong or a sin committed against us, a grave offense, just very angry. Um, I think it's very natural, normal to be angry at God as for allowing something to happen. Um, Anger is one. Confusion, just absolute confusion. Like the world can change from the time we wake up in the morning to when we go to bed at night. The world can completely change with one phone call, one ring at the doorbell, one text message, it's gone. Con- absolute confusion, devastation, shock, um, blame, shifting responsibility onto other people. Um, and then I usually go into control and manipulation of to, okay, I get it. Here's what I'm going to do. I hope everyone plays along with me because I now have a plan as to how we're going to solve this, fix this, end this, make it stop right now. I don't want this discomfort. I don't want this problem. How can I just make it stop right now? Um, And if that doesn't work, then I go into desperation mode and go into overdrive of um, plotting, planning, nagging. Uh, manipulating. Oh, if I just called so-and-so, they could call that person and then they could just happen to run into them and they could sit. And, you know, do you know, am I the only one who has these like imaginary scenarios of how I want things to play out and how they could, how they could happen. And then, um, and then I slap a holy charade on the whole thing to say, you know, with God, all things are possible. Um, And sure he could do all those things, but he generally does not need my advice uh, and things are going to play out a lot of ways, times in ways that are so far beyond our control that the only thing we can control is our own reaction. Um, Peter gives five things that we can control. And he says, the end of the world is coming soon, therefore. And then he gives us these five things that we can control. And the end of the world that is coming soon um, could be, Peter probably meant the return of Christ, like the end of days, the end of everything. And obviously, if we're going to live like Jesus, Peter, Paul, all of the apostles, all of the disciples, we need to live with expectation that that could happen at any time. But that could also be the end of our hopes and dreams, the end of our plans, the end of the pretty little story that we've written for ourselves that now somebody crumpled it up and threw it away. Like it's not happening that way. It could be the end of a relationship, the end of the end of what you thought was going to happen. But the the five things that Peter tells us to do when we face the end are still the same. And they're so surprising because they're not manipulate, control, complain, um, nag, and, and fix things on your own. They are, they are beautiful. They're, they're very different than that. They are, the first one is pray. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, pray. Pray mindfully. He says, pray earnestly, intently, deeply. Um, with with focus and control and earnestness, pray. That is our first thing that we do when we pray. And then sometimes that prayer is just like Peter when he was sinking on the water. It's just, Lord, save me. That's all we can say. We just don't have to be complicated, beautiful prayers. It can be simply, Lord, save me. Um, but it is, it is prayer. The next one that he tells us is to love, to love other people, love every 
one that's around us, of the people that are watching, of the people in our circle of influence, just by loving others, we experience God's love. And the next one is to share. Um, he says, therefore, share cheerfully with those in need. Um, it seems counterintuitive that when we are desperate for help, that we're to share, give instead of receive. Um, but we're allowing other people to share you know, what they have with us, too. Um, then he says to serve using all of our spiritual gifts. Um, I think it's so valuable to know the spiritual gifts that God has given to his people, because not only do we get to um, use the gifts he's given to us, um, I can imagine if prayer being uh, one of your focuses in your podcast, and I'm sure therefore your your life, that the gift of faith, you know, has is something that you have, that you pray for confidently expecting miracles, but other people have have other gifts that we need. Like we need to use our gifts, but we need to receive our gifts. And God has already put everything out there that we need. And then the last one is to praise, just to praise him joyfully. And so there is a strategy that is more aligned with scripture than I usually go through, but I'm so glad God lets me sit with all of that. And he can handle my ranting and my fist shaking and my tears. And he just takes all of that. And then he says, okay, that's now let's really work through something that's that's honoring to my faith that's honoring to my savior and then we can work through those things by those are the only things that we can control sometimes how we pray how we love how we serve how we give and how we praise oh i love that and just practically speaking as i look back in the times in my life when i've had those moments of trying to wriggle out from under what god has put and has said this is for you and i haven't wanted it um my tendency and maybe all of our tendency is to withdraw, to isolate, to wallow maybe a little bit, mm -hmm. to, in my case, obsess or Google my options. And <laughs> <laughs> um, just like those things are not where healing lies. That is the enemies, all of those things. I mean, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Is there a time to make space for yourself? Uh, of course mm -hmm. there is. Yes, yep, there, sure. you, you need to know yourself. If you need space, absolutely. It doesn't mean you have to do everything all the time. Um, but when I look at what my motivations are, if my motivation is fear, if my motivation is- um, Control. Control, there you go. Yeah. Um, th those things, maybe check your motives on those things because when I look at all of these things, praying, loving, sharing, serving, praising, those things all feel very outwardly focused. It feels like you're pouring out when our intuitive response might be to take, to, um, to cut off that outward mm -hmm. flow. And I can just remember a time when I was struggling with some pretty acute anxiety and I could not explain it. I didn't understand why. A lot of it was irrational and I was trying to get out of it and out from under it. And I did cut off a lot of things where I, I said no to things like, oh, I can't do that because I don't feel like it right now. I don't know if I can mm -hmm. engage right now. And some of that might have been OK, but um, but I just remember one place. I remember Alana and I were doing a, a batch of recordings for the podcast and I'm sitting in this chair looking at her over Zoom. And I just I kind of kind of started tearing up. I was like. When I'm in this chair doing what God has called me to do, I have no anxiety. It's gone. Like that was the one place for a season in my life um, mm -hmm. that there was no anxiety at all. And I felt like God was like, this is where you're supposed to be. And I'm sufficient to equip you in this moment to do that. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't times when we're debilitated by whatever it is and, and that we can't right. brush our teeth in the morning. And, and I know mm -hmm. I, I understand that, but, um, but to keep these things in mind and to, um, I don't know, obviously there are different levels of, yeah, we're, we're not saying like, Oh, you know, your child just committed suicide, go volunteer at church. Like that's yeah. what you have to do. It's not exactly, that at all. There. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. But we, we do need to, to know that God has put other people there to come and serve us and to share with us right. and to be open to that. And, and certainly to find that friend that you can confide in that mm -hmm. counselor, uh, that medication, you know, that helps you get through things. Yes. Do it all. But with a heart that says, 
I want to honor the Lord in what he's walking me through. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to all, and, and to just remember that when you can, don't forget to love others. Don't forget to serve where you mm-hmm. can, even if it might not feel comfortable in, in your situation, that there could be healing there and there could be, mm-hmm. you know, God, if God has, has you in a place where that's possible, you know, mm-hmm. there could be healing there too. So there could be very much. So I've, I've yeah. often found that when I least want to do something I, is when I need to do it the most. Yeah. And, and as you're doing it, it's like, it reminds me of when Jesus told the lepers, like, as you're going to the high priest, like, like go to the high priests. And as they were walking, they were healed in their walking, mm-hmm. in their obedience mm-hmm. was when that healing took place. It wasn't before mm-hmm. it was as they were obedient. Yeah. In that walking. You could, yeah. Can't we also look back at the old Testament where the priests went up to the Red Sea and it didn't part until they put their toes in the water. Ooh, that, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you recount many stories. I love how personal this devotional is and how it's not just, you know, there's so much background of the scripture, so much, um, just teaching of the scripture. But in in addition to that, like you said, it's a kind of a different format because there's also some very personal storytelling that I loved. And I couldn't wait to get to the next section where you talked about some of your life stories. And you talk about a story of a good friend that battled what ended up being terminal cancer. And, Mm -hmm. and you talked about just his spirit during that time and that he he didn't complain, but that he grieved. And so can you just share a little bit about um, just about his response, about the important the importance of allowing ourselves permission to grieve the loss of a dream, dream grieve the loss of oh. plans for our future, grieve the, the thing that's been placed in our, in our lives, in our story? Yeah. What kind of faith would we have if we were just told to suck it up and smile? I mean... <laughs> That's just, that does nothing. Just like um, if somebody says, just have faith, have faith in what? I mean, first Peter is very clear. We have our, our faith and our hope is in God. It's in a person. It's not in an outcome. And that's how my friend Joe was. Um, Joe had bile duct cancer and his wife was my dearest, dearest friend. We'd raised our kids together. We planted a church together. We ran, you know, half, half marathons together um, and Joe too, he's so strong and healthy and vibrant and such a tender, um, wonderful man. And when, when we found out he had this cancer that, um, that's one of those times you don't want to go to Google, um, because what you see is not, not encouraging. Um, and he fought so, so hard he took every, every measure that was available to him to, to beat that disease. And, and we all know sometimes it's to no avail, but the last time that I saw him, um, I'd asked him, you know, what, what is God doing in your heart through all of this? And his reply was just, it has never left me. He just said, you know, I used to think when I first got saved, which was a lot of years ago for him that, um, you know, I could pray, you know, every once in a while it was all good. Um, I said my prayers, you know, check that off my list, said my prayers. But now he said, I feel like I'm just praying continually. I'm just sitting in the presence of God with every breath as a prayer. And um, Joe had, at that, he had two girls in college at that time. He had, um, he had another daughter. He had grandchildren. Um, he had a wife he loved very much. And he had a vibrant, vibrant life, of course, he grieved, they all grieved the loss of what would never be the, you know, the graduations and the the new family, the the new grandchildren that he wouldn't be there for. Oh my gosh, of course we grieve. Even Jesus, when, when Lazarus died, when he went to the home of Mary and Martha, he grieved with them and God catches our tears in a bottle because they're precious to him, not because he, um, it's tired of them. He's never tired of us. He never rushes our timeline of, of grief. And he just sits so patiently with us through that. 
Um, so yes, we, we grieve, we grieve. And, we, and then those who, who love them and are with them, we grieve with those who grieve. We mourn with those who mourn. You don't just slap a Bible verse on that and say, yeah, you're going to be okay. Um, or we don't say, but at least, at least what? I mean, at least you had so many good years. No, at least we, yeah, we can't be, we have platitudes for that. We just sit, sit with the sadness. And God can handle it. God can take it. God grieves with us. Um, in Romans, Paul says that that the the Holy Spirit is groaning with when we can't use this. As we're groaning, the Holy Spirit is groaning with us. So even the whole earth is groaning because of the sadness that has come as the result of of the fall. And um, it's not because of somebody's particular sin that they are suffering. It's because of sin and brokenness in the whole world and groaning is such a, a, a an appropriate picture of that when it's just there are no words there are no thoughts there are no prayers it is just a deep groan yeah and it might be I mean I know that it's kind of a trite analogy for what can be just devastating loss and pain and and ultimately you know, many people, most of us will encounter pain in that regard. But I think of when there's, you know, when I have a surprise for my kids that I have a surprise planned, um, like when you pretend that you've forgotten that it's their birthday for a short mm -hmm. time to prepare them for a wonderful surprise later, you know, that day, mm -hmm. or you, um, you know, either, either they think that they're not going to receive something that they really wanted. And then they find out that they did. And, you know, the disappointment that they go through, like in that first mm -hmm. part of not knowing, um, you're, it's still painful to watch. It's still painful mm -hmm. to see. And I know that that's, you know, maybe childbirth is a better example because that pain is very real. And, mm -hmm. and the pain that we experience during childbirth is very painful, mm -hmm. even when you know that there's this tremendous blessing on the either, on the other end of it. I mean, and so yeah. I just imagine, you know, with Jesus, he knew what the end was. He had lived in paradise. Um, God knows what is in store for us. As he said that for the joy, for the joy set before him, he endured yes. the cross. Yes. And Peter says, so now for a little while, if necessary, your faith that, that is tested like gold that goes through fire will result in praise and honor and glory to Jesus Christ. It's almost, you know, it gives you goosebumps it that absolutely when he does. talks about, even though now he said, even though now you must suffer if necessary for a little while, well, I'm sorry, I don't want to suffer. I don't think it's necessary. And for a little while, sometimes feels like forever, it does. but it's a, it's an eternal perspective and it does um, result in praise and honor and glory to God. When we realize that, that Joe has crossed the finish line and the biggest race he'll ever run in his life. His story is, um, is so beautiful. His, his wife, Michelle, um, he was receiving hospice care. He was at home. He died at home. His family was there. She was there. His girls were there. And she had a bottle of champagne ready. And she shook it up and popped the cork and celebrated. something. She wanted to celebrate something eternal with him, something that really, really mattered. And it was finishing that race well, even though it was not the finish line where, where they would have placed it. That is a beautiful picture of just holding that balance of allowing grief, but reminding yourself of the big picture, reminding yourself of that joy, praise joyfully, you know, even mm -hmm. when your heart is broken and breaking, that she was able to still praise joyfully and hold those yeah. two things together. And that's only by the grace of God, I'm sure. Only, but yeah, it is by the grace of God. She's a beautiful, beautiful, steadfast, enduring faith. As I was, as I was writing the book, um, each chapter in first Peter has a theme that emerged. And for first Peter chapter one, it was God's clock. And 
it that chapter ends with the verse that says the grass withers and the flowers fade but the word of the lord stands forever and ever and ever and ever and compared that to the suffering that peter said would be just for a little while god's timing is is the theme of that that chapter and then i just knew that michelle and joe's precious story um told that illustrated that theme so perfectly and she um did a, an interview just like this one with me just a couple of months after he passed and just poured that all out and, and so graciously shared that. And then for every chapter in First Peter, there was a, a similar theme. And I had a friend who had walked through it. Um, and every single one of these women who had been through just such intense suffering shared their stories for God's glory of how he had come through and filled them up with hope and sustained them and brought them through their various and different trials. And I'm so, so grateful that they have just poured so generously into our cups uh, because it takes a lot of courage and vulnerability and bravery to do that. And they, they all did. And then there's one more story at the end of the book that just must be told, and that's yours. It's what God has done through you and how he has sustained you and filled you and even if you're even if you're still in that hard place, I um, have provided some some questions of how how to tell your story, what to leave in, what to leave out, when to speak up, when to maybe not speak up, um, because our stories must be told. They must be told, and that's where the the glory is just multiplied is when it's shared. Because um, you know we talked about us being like the little toddler in the back seat going, where are you taking me? Mm -hmm. And um, when, when our faith has a collision with real life, that, that's really what it feels like that we, we thought we were on a path and then real life comes and it is just like, like we get T-boned in an intersection by a drunk driver. Um, and we don't have any idea. We're just spinning in circles in the middle of the highway. What, what happened? But there is always a crowd of people watching. And you know how when there's a car accident on the road, um, the gawkers cause more of a delay than, right. than the, the actual accident, accident because people stop to watch. And there are always people watching. If it's not in our own home, it's in our neighborhood, in our community, in our churches, even in the heavenly places, we're surrounded by witnesses who are watching and watching to see how we will respond to see, does it make any difference? That fish bumper sticker on your car, does it really mean anything? That conversation that you've had with somebody about um, that you're a Christian, does it mean anything when you are suffering? They are watching and waiting to see what will happen. And we have such an opportunity to have display our unshakable, imperishable hope in Christ. Yeah. And, you know, I, I sort of feel like the times kind of like when you're talking about your friend, Joe, that went through these, these, um, you know, this, this long period of illness. Um, when I feel like when we get to the end of ourselves, when we are pl faced with these circumstances we never would have chosen when we're faced with, um, you know, just personally, when I'm faced with illness, when I'm faced with weakness of the flesh in any way, um, or of the spirit or of my emotions or whatever. Um, I feel like that, that veil between heaven and earth is thinned in a way. And I just mm -hmm. feel like, you know, the Bible says God is close to the brokenhearted. Um, mm -hmm. I think we get out of our own way and we make room for maybe we, we are more open and receptive and more sensitive to God at that, at those times, because our, mm -hmm. we've diminished, we've decreased our, our flesh has weakened so that our, maybe our, our spirits are more open. I don't know the technical <laughs> scientific or spiritual. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think those are the right theological terms to put around that. Um, in the book, we talk a lot about the Tiatwaki. Um, it's not a Greek word or Hebrew word from the Bible, Tiatwaki. It's an acronym for the end of the world as we know it. Yes. And it's not a happy little song that, um, that we used to hear on the radio, but it's the end of the world as we know it. But the end of the world as we know it is only the beginning of knowing Jesus. Mm -hmm. And sometimes he has to bring us to the end of the things that made us comfortable or the things that 
maybe even kept us from him. Um, Peter said to Jesus, so oh, Peter, he said, Satan has asked that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will be strong. And when you have returned, strengthen your brothers. And so that sifting, nobody signs up for that. That is a painful, painful process. And it cost Peter a lot that very night, in fact, <laughs> that the Lord told him that is when he denied that he even knew Christ. But the, um, the other side of that is that we will be strengthened. Our faith does not have to fail and we can return and strengthen other people with the comfort that we've received. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I just have a question. I'm just curious. Do you think there's ever a time to allow ourselves to complain either to God or to others? Or do you feel like there's not a time for that? This is not. I'm oh gosh, curious. this is where we have to. Yeah, it's we have opinion. to hold the scriptures. This, yeah, but yeah, if you can find do, scriptures. do everything without grumbling. Yeah, there you go. Um, okay. Yeah, there you go. But look at the Psalms. Look at David continually saying many, many times, "How long is this going to go on, Lord? How right. long?" In the book, there's a whole exercise where you look up the scriptures of how long, how long, how long. Mm -hmm. And I think that there is there is always room. Um, for us to complain to the Lord. Mm -hmm. We can take anything, any emotion, any experience, any anxiety, we can always take it to him. We can't ever feel that we can't take it to him, but it is, it is taken to him for the purpose of leaving it there. There are many, many, oh, so many times when it's not appropriate to complain to another person. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have to have those safe friendships, pastors, counselors, friendships where we can um, release those things to, for someone who will give us godly counsel and godly prayer. Um, but we take things to the Lord to complain in order to release them. And I think it's, um, one of the things in the book we talk about is what feel real and deal. What am I feeling? Lay it out there. Just it's, it's there. Just lay it out. What are we feeling? But then we say, what is the reality? What's the reality of this situation? The reality of God's promises, the reality of his word, the reality of his truth, the reality of other people, what they might be feeling, our own part in a situation, taking personal responsibility, just being really honest. And this is where friends I think come in. What is real? But then we decide how we're going to deal with it. We get to make a decision of how we're going to respond to, to what is real and how we feel. But it is a process. And we can go through it in a godly way or an ungodly way. That is a, that is a choice, but feel real and deal. They're three very different steps to that process. And that's empowering that it's so empowering because it goes totally against this narrative of, Oh, just, you know, grin and bear it and act yeah. like everything is okay. Even if it's not, it gives us permission to lament and yeah. to it, take things to God that, you know, and, and in the process of acknowledging and expressing that, I, I believe it, it's a form of purging those things mm -hmm. and, and like venting. I mean, you know, that's, we call it venting mm -hmm. when we complain yeah. sometimes, but venting to God, letting some of that pressure yeah. out. Yeah. And it's, I think, a and way to battle the enemy's lies, which again, it is. faster it in isolation. Yes, they do. And we can take those things to the Lord. And sometimes he will, he will tell us through the spirit of the, the spirit's conviction, which we can trust. Um, and sometimes he'll say, you're right. You're right. Your feelings are justified. This mm -hmm. situation makes me angry. Mm -hmm. That was wrong. Um, you weren't wrong. Sometimes he will tell us that we're right. But then sometimes, and this can also be trusted. He will tell us that we're, that we're not right, that our complaints are unjustified, mm -hmm. that we, that we do need to change our perspective, that we do need to look at things eternally, that we need to repent and confess. Sometimes he will do that. Not all emotions are sanctified. You know, our emotions come from our fallenness as well. And sometimes those complaints, um, the act of releasing them to God in prayer is that place where we put words to them and real thoughts around them so that we can hear the truth of God saying, yeah, honey, I'm sorry. That's, I get it. 
but we're not going to stay there. We're, move, we're going to another place. Hmm. Yeah, I, I love that. Well, what was the most surprising thing that you that you discovered in your studies of First Peter? Yeah. I mentioned earlier to you uh, Peter's wife, yeah. and um, I just I love I love her story because it's not told in scripture. Um, we know Peter had a wife because he had a mother in law, mm-hmm. and who Jesus healed. And then Paul says that Peter traveled with his wife. And so we don't picture that like when he, and, and you mentioned yeah. also the last supper with the families, we picture the painting of just yeah. the disciples and Jesus. We don't even think about the families that might've been there. They wouldn't have celebrated the Passover without their families there. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. I loved yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably a much more crowded room. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I learned about his wife, and I'll go ahead and tell you the, the story. Um, the Peter's death is not recorded in scripture. But we do have early church historians who are very reliable, who tell us, you know, what happened to Peter. And the, uh, there was a historian named Eustubius who, who told us about Peter's death. He was taken to Rome and he was crucified for his faith in Christ. And if you go to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, there is a giant obelisk, um, a a very tall, kind of like the Washington Monument, like an obelisk in the center of St. Basilica Square that was actually brought over from Egypt. Um, and was moved to that location but peter probably could see that as he's being crucified Hmm. and the story goes that peter said he was not worthy to be crucified like his lord was and so he was crucified upside down and that's a very famous um like painting that we see just to capture that scene of peter being crucified upside down but eusebius tells us that peter's wife was also martyred for her faith on the same day at the same time and she went first and that when peter saw his wife being summoned home is that's the the phrase that's used being summoned home he called out to her comfortingly and encouragingly he called out to her and what did he say this is my favorite part he called out to her and he said oh thou remember the lord Remember the Lord. I, I really wish Eusebius would have given us her name. <laughs> we had the perfect opportunity there to say her name, but we still don't know her name. But that is what disciples do for one another. When we are suffering, we remind ourselves and we remind other people who are walking along with their own battles with them. Remember the Lord. And I think the fact that Peter ran to the empty tomb and stuck his head in there and he had been at the cross and he had seen Jesus die. And then he saw that empty tomb. And I think Peter seeing Jesus's life and death changed his own perception on his own life and death and his wife too. And he could then say, just remember the Lord, remember no matter what we're facing. Sometimes it doesn't just feel like the end. Sometimes it is the end. It was for Peter and his wife that day. But if we remember the Lord, we will never, ever lose hope. Oh, that is so good, Amy. Thank you for sharing that. I have never heard that story. Never heard, uh, never heard that. So that's very, um, very interesting. And I, I would love to know her name also. <laughs> yeah, we'll know her. Some. There's so many unnamed people in scriptures, but we'll, oh, yeah. we'll definitely get to meet her someday. I love that. Well, we're about out of time, but could you just let us know um, where our listeners can find your books and connect with you online and on social media? Um, Yeah, Um, amylively.com. So it's real easy, amylively.com. And they can also get the book anywhere books are sold. Um, Amazon, Christian Book, Target, Walmart, any any of those places. Um, My favorite, go to your local bookstore and ask for a copy of the book um, to support those local businesses are near and dear to my heart, but they can find it online. There'll be an ebook and they, all of those links are at amylively.com. So that's probably the easiest one. Um, And my links to my socials are there too. Instagram is just Amy Lively. Facebook is Amy Lively author. And I would love to talk with people about, um, how Christ has filled their cup. And then also if they just need that, that drink of hope and need to know where to find that love to connect with them. I have an email I send out every couple of weeks and I'm, I'm very accessible. You send me a message. I'll respond personally. 
Wonderful. Well, Amy, thank you. Thanks for being here today and just sharing this much needed message. Um, and how can we pray for you? I'm going to close this in prayer. Oh, I have a, a couple, a couple things coming up. One, um, well, I'll just give you the biggest one. Seminary. I just started seminary. Yes, I'm I going saw to that. Get, and, yeah. yeah. I'm going to Asbury Theological Seminary, getting a master's in biblical and theological foundations. It's all online, but they have some places where I'll be able to go and, and meet in person. Um, my my to- my goal is to uh, to know God more and love him better and then to write more and better books as well. So that's a huge prayer request because I feel it's been a long, long, long time since I've been in a classroom. I love that. Well, we will absolutely pray for that. Thank you. All right, Amy. Well, thanks again for being here. And I just, yeah, I've, I've loved your book and I hope our listeners get to connect with you. And now I need to go back and read your first book. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> All right. Thank you for pray. having me. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Let's pray. God, we just thank you so much for this time together. Thank you for Amy and just for um, the the message that you placed on her heart to encourage us in finding hope in in these things that we cannot control, um, these things that that turn our world upside down and change us forever in some cases. Lord, we just thank you that you are the source of hope. I just think of Peter's encouragement. I'll never forget now the the encouragement of Peter to his wife. Remember the Lord. And we just pray, God, that as this book goes out, as this podcast goes out, as Amy's words go out from now on into the future, that 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 is a message that will just be a lifeline for so many that need it desperately. Father, we just pray for those listening that are facing life-altering circumstances that they never would have chosen for themselves. Father, we just pray that you would meet them right now, that you would be close to their broken hearts that you would lift them up when they need it, that you would surround them with people that will offer them a cup of hope when they have none in their reserves, that you would sustain them and just allow them, draw them to yourself, God, allow them to draw closer to you instead of putting up a wall between themselves and you in the midst of their pain and their confusion and brokenness. We just pray for healing. We pray for clarity. We pray for next steps We pray for just an infusion of life and hope where there is none. For those of us that know people that are in those situations, God, give us God glasses. Help us to see them. Help us not to overlook a single one that might be suffering silently or hiding pain because they're afraid to show it, because they're afraid of of not putting on a a happy face. Lord, help us to see them. Give us Holy Spirit wisdom to know who needs a prayer, who needs um, an ear to listen or a shoulder to cry on and just help us to be the hands and feet of Jesus to those people around us who are hurting. Help us to have wisdom in our words. Help us to always be um, not just sounding boards, but, but, but people that can point our brothers and sisters to Jesus in every way. Lord, we just pray for Amy as she opens this new chapter, this exciting chapter of seminary. Lord, we just pray that you would extend her time, help her to be efficient and focused, um, order her thoughts and priorities, and most of all, just allow her to grow closer to you, to love you better, to know you more, and, and just to equip her with the tools that she needs to continue writing more and even better books. Thank you for the ones that she has written for her obedience, for her words, and just the wisdom and the hope that she offers. And we just pray that those words would go out to countless women more than she could ever ask or imagine, and that these women would have changed lives, salvations, resurrected prayer lives, um, that, that every single person who reads Amy's words or hears Amy's words would take at least one step closer to you. And we just pray all of these things and all of these blessings in Jesus name. Amen. Amen.